Welcome everybody to the Ibn Abayt Midrash. I have to apologize, Rabbi Breidowitz was not able to make it this week, so I am going to give the shir instead. So the, I'm apologizing for him, for us, but Bezrat Hashem, we will all gain so much from tonight's shir. Now, we're in Parshat Shof team, and what I usually do, I, I love. I love the Kliyakar, and I use the Kliyakar as the basis for our discussion. First of all, he was a very prominent rabbi 400 years ago. He became the chief rabbi of Prague in place of the Maharal. So he's no small guy. And he was an expert in Dikduk. He knew Hebrew so well that Sephardi rabbis accused him of being Sephardi <laughs> because his Dikduk, his Hebrew, was impeccable. So that's one of his strengths amongst many. Okay, so he is so um, spiritual. Ma ma many of his messages are, yes, maybe textually, uh, you know, structured in such a way which is pure logic, but it's, he, gives, he usually gives over an extremely metaphysical and spiritual message. And tonight will definitely fit, fit that bill. Everyone who is spiritually oriented uh, will definitely um, be satisfied, let's say, as long as I'm able to give it over, okay, correctly. So we're going to start in Parshas, uh, when we're in Shoftim, but chapter 20. Now, we're going to read the Hebrew and the English. Uh, basically, we're fo focusing on the words, Kitetze lemilchama al oivecha. Okay, now, when you go out to battle against your enemy, it's singular, your enemy, the first thing he wants to point out, I mean, you have to read the rest of the verse, and you see a horse and chariot, a people more numerous than you, you, you shall not fear them, for Hashem your God brought you up from the land of Egypt. What we're about to introduce, there's a certain authoritative figure. What did I tell you he was called? The, he's a Kohen. Oh, come on, guys. He's a, Mashiach Lemilchama, right? He is the appointed one to lead the Jews in battle. He's a Kohen. And he's going to encourage the people to not have fear. And he's also going to excuse certain people from the front lines, right? We'll talk about that as we go on. So the main thing is to encourage fortitude and strength and courage. Yes, you're about to go out to war. Hashem is with you. You shall not fear. The second verse, it shall be that when you draw near to the war, the Kohen shall approach and speak to the people, and then we're going to hear what he has to say. So let's hear the whole two verses in Hebrew. Ki lemilchama al aivecha, v'ri'ita sus v'rechev, am rav mimcha, v'lo tiramehem, ki Hashem lokecha imach, v'ha... Hamalacha Me'eretz Mitzrayim. He's the one who took you out of Egypt. Fine. So we read the verses. So the Kliyakar begins by letting us know there are many times where you have singular and plural in the same word, in the same ver, in the same sentence, and it can be quite confusing. But there's always a message. So be aware. Like if we knew how to speak Hebrew properly, we would have our tenses in order. We would have our ducks in order, and as Olim Chadashim, which most of us are, the Israelis can pick us off because we mess up our tenses in mid-sentence. So we have to be a little bit... Listen to what he says. Anu tzrichim lemodia lemodai chiluf halashon miyachid l'rabim kama pa'amim. We need to become aware of the chiluf. There's a switch. There's an exchange of the language from yachid, from a singular uh, language to something plural several times and we're going to discuss those times and what they mean as we said it says when you go out against your enemy singular right it says in the same verse v'ri'ita sus v'rechev you will see you would expect susin v'rechavim 
horses and chariots, but it's singular. You will see a horse and a chariot. Is that what you expect to see when you go against your enemy? Maybe if he's one enemy, yeah. But one second, in the same verse, V'yachachach, it says, Am Rav Mimcha. It's a, it's a nation much more numerous than you. Now we already know how many we are. We're 600,000 fighting men between the age of 20 and 60. So you're talking about 3 million people. But if it's more numerous than you, it's more than one. It's more than two. So the Mephorshim explain, right? The commentators say, Ki Hashem, at least from Hashem's perspective, in the eyes of God, Hashem Yisrach, Heim Kulam Kesus Echad. They, the enemy, is small. It's like one horse and one rider. The Im Hu Am Rav, but you know what? <laughs> it does say that they're going to be more, more, more numerous than you. Hainu Mimcha Hu Rav, meaning more numerous than you. That's in your eyes. That's in your eyes. Velo Be'inei Hashem Yisrach. So remember, what is this Cohen saying? Do not fear. Do not fear. In Hashem's eyes, it's going to be easy as pie. You, the fear is all in you, because you're looking at them as a multitude, a strong and mighty army. So that's the first thing to point out. Not in Hashem's eyes, maybe in yours. And the word that says, Ki say when you go out, Lashen Yachid, it's you singular. But afterwards in verse 2, if I'm not mistaken, it says, it shall be that when you draw near to the war. Now that's what? Plural. Look what it says. Kikaravchem. When you as a multitude draw close. You as a singular person are going out, but the closer you get, the more numerous you become. Lashon Rabim. This is just really an introduction to what we're going to discuss, because he doesn't really answer this yet, but he says the kaf, that's the letter kaf, is hadimyon shel kikaravchem. It's as you draw near. Literally, as you draw near, tzricha biur. It needs clarification, because he says, and remember, he's an expert in dikduk, he says it should have written bikaravchem, in your drawing close. Why? We don't really have, we're not experts. We'll trust him for now, and you'll see later when it, the, we'll understand the cuff in more than one way, and why the Torah wrote it that way. In the meantime, the Kliyakar begins to say, the Omerani, I'm going to tell you. The way I see it is like this. When there is actually peace amongst the enemies, the enemies, like, you can imagine, right? We live through it here in Israel. You have seven Arab nations. They all hate each other. But you know what? There's something unifying about them. They all hate us. So when there's peace amongst them, az ha musukenet biyoter. It's even more dangerous for us. When there's peace amongst our enemies. And thank God, this is changing. And it has, Baruch Hashem, for the last 70 years, proven to be the fact that they really do hate each other and other things fall, you know, slip in, in, in between. Ki kulam nosdu peh echad el Hashem v'yal meshicho. All of them, they are, are like speaking with one mouth against Hashem and His anointed. Who is His anointed? We are. Aval. Right? That's when they're unified. When they are divided, when they are, where their hearts are not unified, they're not considered one unit. It's not so dangerous. And we're going to see how and why this is how it works. <coughs> the clear card continues. This is the magnificent miracle magnificent miracle that Hashem does with His people Israel. Even though, in the very beginning, when we would go out to war, 
Kol ha'umos nishabru, all the nations that we're going to fight against, they seem to be united. Ki'ilu ha'ikulam sus v'rechavechad, ki'ishachad. They seem to be unified as one. That's when we go out to war. Mikol makom, however, you know what happens. Ke karavchem, as we approach, el ha'milchama, towards the battle, Veini veini means in the meanwhile, Yishlach Hashem behem et hamuhuma. Hashem sends a massive amount of confusion and pandemonium and chaos amongst them. <coughs> the Yifardu ish al achiv, and they separate from each other. Right? The word Yifardu, par- pared. They are separated from each other, from one, from the other. In fact, they will even pick up the sword against each other. And we've seen it in our own lifetimes. As the Pusik says, there's an amazing Pusik in 28.7. This is in Deuteronomy 28.7. It says, now listen carefully, the Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be beaten before you. They will come out against you in one direction, meaning unified. What's the rest of the verse? But they will flee from you in seven directions. In 1948, we had seven Arab armies come against us. And I mean, getting goose, goosebumps just saying it, yeah? Listen to the Hebrew. Yitain Hashem esoy vecha, hakamim alecha, nigafim lefanecha. Bederich echad, in one way they're coming, Yetsu alecha, they're coming against you, U drachim yanusu lifanecha, but in seven different directions or, or ways they're running away from you. Okay, so he says, Lefisha bahatkala he bahaskama achas. In the beginning they all had an agreement, that's true. They were all in agreement. Let's wipe out the Jews, throw them into the sea. Baini, baini. And then meanwhile, Yishlach Hashem behem ha But in the meanwhile, Shem sends chaos and pandemonium, total confusion. Liot chalach libam, in order to separate their hearts. Hashem does this. This is the miracle that He does for us. At shekol sheva umos, until those seven nations... They're all running with their tails between the legs in a different direction. Just as it says in Psalms, chapter 21.13, it says, for, now this is interesting, because one thing you have to learn, you cannot really truly learn Torah in any other language other than Hebrew. Okay, so I don't know what other language translates it, however they translate it differently, but in the English it says, For you shall place them as a portion with your bowstrings, well, that is a weapon of war, you shall set your arrows toward their faces. Now in Hebrew it says, Ki tashitemo shechem. Shechem is a lot, is a portion, which in Hebrew is chalak, which is division. So think of it like this, For you shall place them as divisions. They're going to come against you as one, but in the end, you will divide them. They will be divided. Okay? You only see that in the Hebrew. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, look at Rashi. Rashi on that verse, when it says, you shall place them as a portion, he says, for you shall place them as a portion that Israel will divide their money. It says in Isaiah 23, 18, and her commerce and her hire shall be holy to the Lord, and it shall not be stored, nor shall it be inherited, but those who sit before the Lord shall have her commerce to eat their fill and for stately clothing. Holy to the Lord. Meaning the righteous are destined to plunder when the King Messiah comes, and it shall not be stored to be a treasure for her kings, and it shall not be inherited. They will not leave it over to, as an inheritance to their children. But it's going to come to us, okay? It's going to be divided up by us. Okay. So, this is what he says here. Dahainu lechalkam lechalakim, to divide up their divisions. That's what happens when we conquer. The next paragraph. 
This is what it means. When it says, When you go out to war against your enemy. I'm pointing out it's singular. And how do you know it's singular? Because it's really one Yud. If it would, if it would be plural, it would be two Yuds. It would be like, plural, Shocha, so Oivecha with two Yuds would be Oivim Shocha, but here it's without that extra Yud, it's only one. It means your enemy, your singular enemy, as he points out below Yud at Sohabait, without that second Yud. Next, Hamoira al Oyev Echad. It's reflecting, it's teaching, we're talking about one enemy. Vereita Sus Verechev Am Rav Mimcha, as the verse says. You see one horse, one chariot, or one rider. But it says, Am Rav Mimcha, uh, with a people more populous than you. How can that be? If it's all just one, how are they more pop, popul- pop? I'm talking about the word population. They're more populous. That's a word? More populous. It's not a word. Write in the comments. Let me know. Meaning to say, Am Rav Kazes, such a numerous or great nation like this. In, in number, Kulam Nitvadu El Emek Shave Bahatchala Ki Ishachad Vaksusachad Varechavachad. They're all gathered. Kulam Nit from the word Vaada, right? Nitvadu. They're all gathered. They're all representing some deep concept. El Emek Shave. Um, uh, they're sharing a common denominator in the very beginning, as if they're all one person, because they all hate the Jew. The Koluma Ameris Lechaverta, and each one of the nations is saying to the other nation, Kisusi, Kisusach. My horse is like your horse. What I have is yours. My tanks are your tanks. You can use my nuclear weapons. You can share, right? We, I don't want to mention any nation's names, whether it's North Korea, Iran, okay, whatever. Right? They all want to share their goods. And when we, feel, when we hear this, that they're sharing uh, their weapons, and they are in Haskam, their own agreement against us, this causes a certain amount of, not cowardliness, but uh, a weakness of heart, Right? I guess cowardliness fits. The Fikachamra, that's why, what is the Kohen? That was the, the, the leader of the army is going to say, Al Tira, do not fear. Look in verse 3. These are just paraphrase. Lo mayhem, you don't fear from them. The lo mahamunam, and not from their large numbers. This should not affect you. Look at verse 3. He shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, you are coming near to the battle against your enemies. Let your heart not be faint. Do not be afraid. Do not panic. Do not be broken before them. I'll just read four for the sake of it. For Hashem, your God, is the one who goes with you to fight for you with your enemies to save you. So let's read uh, verse 3 in Hebrew. The Omar Lehem, Shema Yisrael, Atem Karevim Hayom Lemilchama Alaivechem. Al Yarech Levovchem, Al Tirau, the Al Tachpazu, the Al Tartu, Mip Nehem. Okay, so let's go on. He wants to bring this up for a reason. Because he's telling us, Kila Sof, in the end, this is God's promise, man. Kila Sof, Yit Pardu Ishmi El Achiv. They will be broken up. We've seen it so many times. Right? There's seven nations that come against us, but they all fight with each other in the end. There's no shalom between them. And that's what it means when it says, Atem krevim hayom lemilchama alaivechem. Alaivechem is plural. That you are approaching, krevim, but it's also plural. As you're approaching, okay, today to the battle against your enemies, it says, Lush and Rabim. Why? Listen to this. Ki beterem yikrav aleyem Yisrael chafitzam Hashem. Remember, it says, you, then when, they, when you're first going out to battle, they're like one. But as you get closer and closer and closer, there's many enemies. <clears throat> Don't be afraid. 
There are not many that's the same enemy that's now broken up into smaller groups. And those smaller groups mean that they are divided. <laughs> Listen to the wisdom here. I'm going to read that last, second to the last line. Keep Peterim. It means before Yikravalem, before you even get close to them, before the Jewish people get close to them, Hafitzam, that's like to disperse, to be dispersed, Hashem. Hashem disperses them. Umasak ruach of im, and he covers them with a spirit of confusion and distortion. And wait till you hear what he say next. Not the next few words, but the next paragraph. Vachalak libam zemizeh, and their hearts become divided. Okay. Ulumat zeh. Now, in spite of this, Gam bi Yisrael oisik nashbaruch sheni. God will create another miracle for the Jewish people. If you thought. That was fantastic. Wait till, what do they call that? You know, when you have a play, it's the next scene. Wait till you hear the next scene. Ki im b'shas ha-yetziya l'milchama yatsu matemis par. If it's true that when you go out to war, you have a small amount of number, I want you to know, we're going to read later what the Kohen is actually going to say to the people. Right? That if what? If you had just gotten married, right? You're betrothed, you didn't even consummate the marriage. Go home, right? If you, what? Built a home and you didn't live in it yet. Go home. If you have a vineyard and you didn't yet uh, take the tithes, you didn't uh, benefit yet from your own work, hard work, go home. And if you're afraid, go home. So where are we going with this? That who's left to fight? Who's left? Only tzaddikim. Are you aware of this? You have, let's say, 100,000 candidates for the war, and by the time the Cohen's finished, there might be 20,000. Because people are afraid. If you're afraid, you go home. We don't want you on the front lines. So out of those 20,000, up against who knows how many millions, but guess what? That's been our story. That's how the war is to be fought, by the yeshiva guys by the tzaddikim, okay? The people who are strong in their, we're, we're going to talk about it, strong in their, we'll call it Yiddishkeit, strong in their faith. Okay, they have nothing to fear. So let's go on. So he says, So that if it's such a small number, we're unified, we're going out, as the verse began, when you go out against your enemy, it's singular. So it's, it's a small amount, but what's happening here? Kach b'hat chala, stusly in the beginning, near in Yisrael, muatim b'nei o'idim. They looked at us as a small amount of number, because that's how they saw us originally, right? You have 20, you had 100,000 people, 80 went home, and you're left with 20,000 skinny yeshiva guys. Listen to what the enemies are like, <laughs> they're laughing. They saw just a few amount of guys. Baini, baini, but what's going to happen in the meanwhile? Yishlach Hashem, Ezra, Hashem will send His assistance, His help. Sha'oidim yiru tselaharim kanashim. Hashem will create illusions. They will be in such a pandemonium because of the illusions. They'll see the, what do you call it? The shade, the shadow of the sun setting on the mountains. And it looks like an entire platoon of army coming down the mountains. You can just imagine, right? If you ever saw those movies where the old, uh, you know, Romans, they come out of the forest and the whole field is just full of people. You, when the further you are, you can't make out the people. So Hashem will create these illusions, whether with sound. I don't want to get too much into the, uh, the, the it's called the Davitka. You heard of the Davitka um, cannon? There's Davitka Square. I don't remember which war it was. I think it was 48. There was this... I don't know what they call it, uh, a dud. You know about this? The Davika cannon. It's right on Davika Square. It makes a loud noise? Well, they didn't expect it to make such a loud noise, and they certainly expected a shell to drop somewhere. But I don't think, I don't think it was even close to being accurate. And, but it made such a loud noise that the army, the enemies, ran. They thought it was nuclear. <laughs> okay? Only these things can happen with Hashem's help. It's not, okay, I mean, with genius, I mean, maybe, maybe they actually planned it that way, I don't know. But uh, from all accounts, that was not the plan. <laughs> yeah, I 
Yeah. And? Yeah, so they escaped without fighting. Because they, they, they thought that, at least the Jewish Russian speakers, but they thought the uh, Soviet Union came, came to help the Jews. Okay, and? and then, okay, let's stick to the text. Okay, I, I don't know where you're going with that, but uh, I, I like what you're saying. Okay. Let's uh, stick here. So he says, as it says in 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 6, it says like this. This happened in our own history. And now the Lord caused the Aramean, uh, Ar Aramean camp to hear the sounds of chariots and the sounds of horses and the sounds of a great army. And they said to one another, the enemy, behold, the king of Israel has hired us for the kings, us for the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Okay, so the, basically the Hebrew that he wanted us to see was... Adonai Hishmiya Esamachana Aram Ko, right? That God caused us to hear these these sounds. So that's what God did. He made this maybe in audio visual, right? Where the shadow going down the mountains seemed like there was in a a whole I don't know what they're called, a platoon, whatever this a whole group of army people coming, or through the sounds, as we just saw in, um, in, in Second Kings. Okay? And here you have proof. That even if you have a small group of people, Hashem will make them appear as if they are many. So the nations will be afraid. So far, so good. And now we understand when it says, It will be as you approach. Not in your approach, but as you are approaching. El hamilchama. So the kaf, the kaf is a dimyon, meaning it's a as if. Dimyon means as if, a similarity. Is going on Lashon Rabim, that is the word itself. It's plural, kikaravchem, as you, the plural, the many, the masses. You're not the masses. You're a small group, but you will appear as many as you approach. It's all in that one Hebrew word, kikaravchem, to tell you, shatem nirim karabim. You will appear as many. Afapisha lefia emis enokain. Even though the truth is, you are not many. You're you're few. Kiatem Hamaat, since you are really in truth very small number, and he ends that paragraph with his famous signature, Ze Perush Yakar. This is a precious uh, explanation, and that's why he's called, he called himself the Kliakar, because he ends off uh, many times by saying this is a Perush Yakar. And up until now, you have to admit that is sweet. Now we're beginning verse 3, the explanation of verse 3, where this Kohen, he's a Mashiach Milchama, he's the anointed one to lead the war, and he says, Shema Yisrael. When you hear those words, Shema Yisrael, what does it remind you of? But he doesn't, doesn't, we don't have Shema Yisrael, Shem Elkein, Shem Echad. It just said, he shall say to them, Hero Israel, you are coming near to the battle, Right? Don't be afraid. So guess what? The Kliakar is going to tell us he is reminding them of the Shema Yisrael and most likely he's having everybody say Shema Yisrael together. Let's hear Rashi says. He's quoting Rashi. Rashi says, In other words, when we spoke about being afraid, we're talking about Fear of sin. If you know you did a lot of mitzvahs, so you have less to be afraid of. You did very few sins, you have, very, you have nothing to be afraid of. I want you to know the Gomorrah actually says, what kind of person is excused from the army? What kind of sin should he be afraid of? Now you're going to be shocked, for some of you. It says if you talk between putting your arm, your arm to fill in and your head to fill in. I'm sorry. 
He says, even if you just wink your eye, it's not even talking. What kind of interruption is that? It's like we say it's forbidden. Okay? It's called a sin, and it's big enough that one should be afraid that if he even winked his eye once while putting on his tefillin, between his arm tefillin and his head tefillin, go home, don't fight. So you know who's left. Really just the tzaddikim, right? Hopefully we'll all pick up the message that we shouldn't even wink when we put on our tefillin. Right? We know that interrupting is forbidden. Svarim, they make a second bracha, if they do, otherwise they only make one. Ashkenazim always make two bracha, and we say, Brokshem Kavod, Mokzulim, that anyway, but we don't talk. But some people are not aware of this. Maybe they're aware, but they wink, they use hand signals, even that's forbidden. Okay? At least we can walk away knowing that. But more than that, we know how righteous the army was. Okay. So he says that even if all you have, you're not a major learner, you're not a big Ben Torah, you're not a, a Tamil Chacham, and you may not have a lot of mitzvahs in your belt. The only mitzvah you could put in your belt and say that you do regularly is Shema. That's what Rashi seems to be saying. Um, where is it? We said it's... Um, um, so I don't have that. Okay, I have the Hebrew, but okay. <coughs> So the Kriya Karyash right away, what? The Kriyashma is such a small thing, a big thing, I'm not really sure what you're trying to say here. So he explains that the Iker who is the Tefillin of Shabarosh. We're talking about the Tefillin of the head. Did you know that when we went out to war, we went out wearing our phylacteries, whatever a phylactery is, uh, Tefillin. We wore our Tefillin. And we, taught, we, we, met, we wound it tight. So the arm to fill in is probably not a big deal because that's wound very tight. The head to fill in, they must have wore helmets with a cutout for the tefillin, or they wore turbans. Somehow or another, that if they're going to run or ride horses or do whatever they do in a war, throw around a sword, hold a shield, you, you must, it must be on very good, right? Okay. So apparently... They wore the tefillin. We know. We, they, they, you're, we're, really actually, we're actually supposed to wear tefillin all day long. The reason we don't is because you need to have a clean body, a clean mind, and a clean environment. And most of the time, if we're not sitting and learning all day, that's uh, very difficult to accomplish. Okay. So anyway, the iker of the tefillin shorosh is what is the shma? Ki akoyra kriya shma. Because when we do say the shma, in the morning, we're wearing our tefillin. You're supposed to wear tefillin during davening. And I'm talking to the men, of course. Okay. Women are exempt because it's like they have tefillin on all the time. They're so holy. So, mistava eno kore ki'im al yudei tefillin. Obviously, the, the kriya, the reading of the Shema, comes about also because of the tefillin. Because we're not supposed to be what? Adim Sheker. We're not supposed to testify falsely about ourselves. We're saying the words that are in the tefillin. The Shema, it's in the mezuzah, it's in the tefillin. And we're saying those words, so you should have the tefillin on when you're saying it. So you're not a, um, a false witness on yourself. <coughs> and that's brought down in Gemara Brachos 14b. So Ayyadeh Tefillin Shibarosho are you aware that when you see a Jew riding on a horse, carrying a sword and a shield, and he's wearing his tefillin, this, you, you probably think they're crazy, right? You know, they say when you're in a, war, in a fight with somebody, if you really act crazy, they'll probably run away. So here you have these black boxes on your head. The truth is that the black boxes should instill a certain, I'm going to call it healthy fear, but a mus of a fachad an absolute dread on our enemies. And how do we know? Look in chapter 28, verse 10. See, in 28.10 it says, Then all the peoples of the earth will see that the name of the Lord is called upon you, and they will fear you. By the way, the Gemara in Brachot 6a goes through how to prove this. I'm not going to go to that right now. Maybe, I, maybe I, I'll read it. You know, this is good stuff. So, Rabbi Avin Bar Avada said in the name of Rabbi Yitzchak, from where is it derived that God wears tefillin? So in Isaiah 62, 8, 
the Lord has sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength. Since it's customary t to swear when you make a, an oath on holy objects, it's understood, because that's how the verse says, he swore by his right hand that he's wearing the Torah on his arm, now specifically his right arm. That refers to the Torah, as it says in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2, from his right hand, a fiery law for his people. So that's the Torah. What about the arm of his strength? So that's his left hand, and that is referring to the phylacteries. And it says in Psalms 29, 11, the Lord gave strength to his nation. So the strength is now on us. And that strength, you know, that is in Psalms 29, 11, the Lord gave strength to his nation in the form of the mitzvah of phylacteries. The Gemara asks, and from where it is derived, where do you know that the phylacteries provide strength? And that's the verse right here in verse 28, uh, chapter 28, 10. And all the nations of the land shall see the name of the Lord is called upon you, and they will fear you. Now, how do you know specifically of the head? Because that's the verse, the verse actually sp spells it out, that the name of the Lord is called upon you, it's on you. Okay, so on you, that would be the head. Okay, let's go back into the Kliakar. So he, now he says, hey, let's fill in Rosh. We've been speaking about the tefillin Shel Rosh. That is where, that's upon you. This is actually a necessity in a war. That the, the nations that hate you will see it upon you and they will fear from you. Ah, You know what? Even the Shema, the Shema we say at night, says us. It saves us from what? Just like it saves us from damagers, like we're talking about shading types of uh, the demons and, and anything that would damage us. So too. Just like it saves us in the spiritual sense from damage, it saves us also from the nations. Asher kocham min sarim shamala, who actually derive all their energy anyway from the administering angels from above. And now we understand, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there's a Medjish Rabbah in Bamidbar Rabbah 2019, uh, then Kriyashma is related to this verse. So we'll, we'll see that it's, in the Medjish it relates it, but let's just talk about the verse. The verse you can find in Numbers 23:24. It says, Lo Yishkav, right, it will not lie down, we're talking about the Jewish people, Ad Ochel Teref, until it consumes its prey, vedam chalolim yishte, and drinks the blood of the slain. In other words, we won't go to sleep until we have conquered. That's what the verse implies. So too, we're talking about the Krishna night. We won't go to sleep until we gain the strength enough to conquer those evil forces, uh, spiritual forces. Keep shutem so far, the truth is everything we talked about up until now is talking about an actual war against physical enemies. Up until now. And however, now in Gemara Brachos, in uh, page 5a, it says like this, Le'olam yargiz adam yetzer tov al yetzer hara. A person needs to fight a battle. He needs to anger. He needs to get all riled up with his good nature over his evil nature. And how do we know? There's a verse, the King David. I just want to reiterate this idea. There's nothing in the Nach part, the, the prophets in Kesuvim, that has not already been revealed in the five books of Moses. The prophet cannot reveal anything new. He's there to rebuke and get us back on the path of what we were told at the revelation of Mount Sinai. So if King David said it, there's already hints to it in the five books of Moses. I'll read the whole verse, I'll translate the verse, and then we're going to break it into four parts. It says in Psalms chapter 4, verse 5, Rigzu vi'al techatu'u, tremble and sin not. Imru bilvavchem, reflect or say in your hearts. Al mishkavchem, upon your beds. Vidomu Sela and be silent, utterly silent forever.
What does that verse mean? According to our tradition, it's telling you what you need to do to fight your Yetzirah, to overcome and be victorious in this war. I'm going to call it jihad. I'm going to call it a personal jihad. Okay? I like that term. So he says, first, rigzu, get riled up against your, your Yetzirah and don't sin. The Iazel mutav. If that works, great. Meaning the Yetzirah ran away and you're, you're in good, good shape. The Ilo, if that doesn't work, Yikrat Batorah, learn some Torah. And how do we know? Because the next part, you should contemplate in your hearts. The Torah should be on your hearts. Imru Bilvavchem, Iyazil, if that works, the Yitzhar runs away. Mutav, excellent, good. You're in good shape. Vilo, if not, Yikra Krishma. That's when you have to say, you know, what else are you going to do? You got plan A, didn't work. Plan B, Torah, didn't work. Now, plan C, read the Shema. As it says, Al Mishkavchem, upon your beds. That's what we do. That's what it's referring to. Reading the Shema at night. Iazil, if the, the Yetzirah ran away. Mutav, great. Ilo, Yizkor lo, y- lo Yom HaMisa. Plan D, right? Remember the day of your death. Hopefully that will be the last stop. And the, re- the truth is, the Yetzirah is afraid of your death. Because you're like a, he's like a parasite. He's hanging on, he's clinging on. If you're dead, he's got to leave you. And there's nothing left to, to be in, uh, energized with. So, as soon as you, and we, we spoke about this earlier this week. If you're faced with a dilemma, you have two very good friends. One is sitting shiva, you want to visit him. It's a house of mourning. And the other friend is getting married. Right? What do we say? It's in um, King Solomon says, go to the house of mourning. Better to go there than logic wouldn't say that. Look, I don't, who wants to be depressed? Who wants to? Guess what? This is what life's about. Being sober. Having a clear mind. We're, we're in a battle. We're in a personal jihad against our Yetzirah. And apparently going or reminding yourself about the day of your own death is instrumental in getting rid of the Yetzirah, which we will see as we continue reading the clay fire. Okay. So here we are. The Arba Elu, these four stages, are Niskaruba Parsha Zu, are also hinted at and spoken about and mentioned in our Parsha. As it says, now this is in chapter 23, verse 10. 23, verse 10, it says like this. When a camp goes out to war against your enemies, Kitetse machane al aivecha, v'nishmarta mikol davara. You should guard against anything evil. What in the world is it talking about? What does it mean, guard against anything evil? Well, the truth is, if you look at the next, the rest of that verse, the next couple of verses, it's talking about nocturnally missions, which we all know we'll talk about. It happens to do with what a man thinks of during the day and during the night, um, having nocturnal emissions. But also, one of the 613 commandments is that an army, you know, every army soldier, every soldier, every fighter, has to have amongst his weapons a shovel. Because he should not go to the bathroom within the camp. He goes to outside the camp and uses the shovel to take care of his needs. Okay. So, the nishmart and mikol Rashi says something most fascinating. He says that since the Sutton, the Fisha Sutton Mekatre Vishasakana, that what does the Sutton do? The Sutton happens to be the Yitzhar, by the way, and we all have it within us. It persecutes, prosecutes, prosecutes us, especially in a time of danger, right? So if you have what to fear from the Satan, don't stand at the edge of a cliff. Don't stand beyond the yellow line next to the light rail or the subway, right? You don't put yourself in dangerous situation. And that's why the Kohen said, if anybody's afraid, afraid of what? Afraid of sin. He shouldn't go, and he shouldn't go to the war. So you're putting yourself, if, okay, let's go like this. Since the Sutton actually per- prosecutes at the time of danger, 
And who is this prosecutor? It's the Satan, which is the Yetzirahara. And it's Mishtadel Lahatia et Adam It does everything it can to cause a person to sin in the war, right? Whether it's murder, obviously, you know, shooting somebody in the back who's running away. Or there's stories about people they don't want to keep prisoners because it's a big hassle, so they kill prisoners. There's so many things that can go wrong in war in, from your side and do sins. Plus, okay, this is not a, a very PC subject, but I'll talk about it anyway. Many robberies take place, right? But there's also rape, a lot of abuse, a lot of abuse. I want you to know one thing about the Jewish people, and as far as I know, we have never been accused publicly through courts, whatever, of rape of the enemy. And that is very unusual because every war that seems to have happened from time immemorial, women are, suffer the most in war. Not just from dead husbands and, and devastation and hunger, but a lot of times, unfortunately, from rape. It's forbidden, right? There's a whole thing of Yafas Torah, we're not going to get into that right now. But at the time when you're swinging a sword, and there's blood all over, the adrenaline is going, and you can lose yourself. Okay? So a lot of sin can take place. And that's what he says. Makam Sakana. Especially in this Makam Sakana. So you're doing sin. In a Makam Sakana, you're basically putting your own life on the line. Kedela, Pilo, Biyad Oivav. And this is all the Sutton's um, scheme, so that you end up falling in front of your enemy. So especially during a war, a man, a person, must be especially careful against the Yitzhara. Because in any place that has danger, it um, provokes a man even more in, than any other place. Right? When you're in war, with the adrenaline going, and the blood, and the women, and everything else, lahatos ladavara, to, to lean, and to fall, and to sin, with something evil as that. And now we know why the verse says, davara, guard against anything evil, that you shouldn't even think, shalom yahaher adam biyom, a person, a man, shouldn't think during the day, whatever it is, the yavoli day carry belayla, and come to nocturnal emissions at night. So here's the question. What, you mean just during war you have to be careful? Not any other time? Rather, he's saying, you know what? We already stated this, that the Yitzhar really comes against you during the war. So heim bedavar erva, whether it's illicit sexual relations or b'shara veiros or any other sins, k'de lahapilo biyad oivav, in order to have you drop in front of your enemies. That's why the Torah teaches. This is the lesson the Torah is teaching you. Al kain limda ma Torah shu mizorazim b'milchama laamod keneged yitzram. It's especially necessary when you're at war to gather your strength against your Yetzirah, so it doesn't bring you to a sin, but makam sakana. Now, I'm just going to sum up the next three lines. He basically says that he has examined not just this part, but many of them are fortunate to talk about this, and they all, the ones he's explaining, many of them use this parsha as only an example of what you need to do to fight your Yetzirah. And they take it out of context. They, meaning, there's pshat, that it's a real war. And, there's another pshat, that it's just the internal war. So, he has a problem that many of the Mephorshim have taken it out of its real context, or one level of context is a real war, and they only discuss it on a metaphysical level. And also, the other way around. He wants to say, they both work perfectly well together. That it's true, you cannot take it out of its simple meaning. It's got to be giving us really good advice about war. And it's got to be telling us the inner war as well. Um, I, I, I'll read it anyway. Okay, let, me, let me read what he says. Shapirush 
Shapirusha Kol Hamil Chamos Shapaparsha Zu. The explanation of all these words that the Parsha talks about is regarding Milchamos Adam in Yitzro, is discussing a war with a man in his heart, in his uh, his um, uh, evil inclination. V'davar Zerachok Mekil Yotai. But that explanation is so far from reason. To what? To take it out from its simple explanation. So he writes, what has been written um, they took it out from what's written that's so obvious from every, from every angle to teach you to remove it from just teaching you how to, how to win against your enemies I'm going to tell you the lesson he's going to tell you I, I don't want to take anything away from you in order to win the war against your enemy you have to first fight the inner battle. They go hand in hand. Do not think this is just a recipe of how to fight the external enemy. Don't think this is just a recipe of how to fight the inner enemy. They go hand in hand. You don't stand a chance against your external enemy unless you win the battle first within yourself. And they're both necessary lessons. Let's hear what he has to say. I, I just want to continue reading his words because it's so beautiful. Uh, they, the only way you're going to win against the nations is when you have your own actions in check. And you won't lose a single man because of sin. Okay, that's why it says, It will be as you draw near to the war, with the nations, so we're talking about the physical war, what will happen? You will fear from your own sin that you won't fall into it uh, by the, the strength of your Yitzhahara. Don't forget these words. It's the, it's the Satan that is coming against you at the time of danger. What did we say? There were four, remember King David? In chapter, I think it was chapter 5, verse 4, he said, it was 4, verse 5, let me just check. It was chapter 4, verse 5. He gave us the, the, he gave us the outline, four things. Go, try to overcome Yetzirah, if that doesn't work, learn Torah, if that doesn't work, read Krishna. if that doesn't work, think of the day of your death. He says, our parsha includes all those concepts. Listen. So the first thing, you should fear from sin. That you don't fall. Fine. So then, if that doesn't work, then learn Torah. And we, how do we know? Because it says, the nigasha kohen v'dibar elam. The kohen approaches them and speaks to the people. The word dibar... You know what a Gezerah Shava is? It's one of the 13 hermeneutical principles. Diber Elam, if, if the he, the Kohen, is going to speak to the people, the word Diber is a hint to Lidaber Moshe. Moshe spoke. What did Moses speak? He spoke Torah. Not, not only did he speak Torah, there's a special halacha that there are many things in this world that you can communicate in any language. There's certain things you can only do in Hebrew. This is going to be one of them. When the Kohen gets up there and speaks to the Jewish people, he must speak in Hebrew. And how do we know? Because the Gezer Shava, just like Moses spoke Hebrew to the people, the Torah is in Hebrew. Guys, we've got to learn Hebrew, right? So too, it's called a Gezer Shava. It's in an, a, um, I forget, the, in English what they call it. Um, I think I wrote it down. Um, but I'll tell you what's in Hebrew. <laughs> when you have one word in one section of the Torah and the same word in another section of the Torah, that there will be a halakhic connection. What applies over here applies over there. This only works through tradition. It doesn't work if you are fancied by a certain word here and you say, wow, I saw the same word over there. I'll make all these connections. You can make all the connections you want. But in halakha, it only makes a connection if it's through tradition. And what he's about to say is that it works in both directions. It also has to work. A Gezer Shava has to go back 
in, it can't just work one way. Whatever is true is over here, is going to be true there, and whatever is true here is going to be true there. And let's hear what he has to say. So we know in Mesechet Sota 42a, well, so let me just tell you what the, the English term for that, because that I have here. Uh, 42a. Here it is. Uh, I'll read. I'll just read what he says. With regard to the priest who is anointed for war, at the time he would speak to the nation, he would speak to them in the sacred tongue, being Hebrew, as it says. And it shall be when you draw near to the battle that the priest shall approach and speak to the people. He's approaching and speaking to the people. What, what language do the people speak? Hebrew. So that you can find, we just said, Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 2. The priest identified in the verse is called, what do we call him? The Mashiach Milchama. Okay. Um, he's appointed for war. The priest who is inaugurated specifically to serve this function and speak to the people. He addresses them in the sacred tongue. And this is a Mishnah. The Mishnah tells us this. The Gemara later on says, it wants to, the Gemara wants to clarify an ambiguous point in the Mishnah. What is it saying? When the Mishnah derives from this verse that the priest must address the people in Hebrew. The Gemara says, this is what the Mishnah is saying. That the ruling is derived from, here it is, verbal analogy. That's what a Gezer Shava, that was what I was looking for. The word Gezer Shava means a verbal analogy. This word is here, that word is there, works both ways. As it says here in our verse, and speak, the Kohen is going to speak, and over there by the giving of the Torah in Exodus chapter 19, 19, it says Moses spoke. So this is only through tradition. You can't learn it out any other way. I'm sure you would like to, but that's the way it works. Okay, so now we know that learning Torah is somehow hinted at. But it's not, it's not a, that's not alone. That's not enough. So he says, Malaholin Belashin Kodesh, just like over there uh, by Moshe, it was in Hebrew, Afkan, so too, Afkan came. It has to be in Hebrew. But I'm going to say, the clear card says, En Gezer Shava L'Chatzain. You can't use a Gezer Shava only halfway. It has to go the other way as well. So, Malahalin Talmud Torah, Afkan HaKohen, Medaber Elam Bedivrei Torah. He's actually saying it's, it's, it's Torah itself. Just like there it's Torah, here it's Torah. And you know what? Joshua was punished for what we call Beetle Torah. You remember the scene where he, he wakes up and he's in a dream and he sees this angel and he has a discussion with this angel and the angel has a sword? So listen to the conversation. You can find this in Joshua chapter 5, verse 14, where the angel says, See now that I have come. I have now come. What does it mean now come? He could have come earlier for a different sin. The sin here was Bittul Torah. So you can find this in Erevin 63. And I'm going to read to you a little bit of it. Now I just have to find it. Here it is. First of all, Joshua did not have any male sons. We can find that out when you read Second, uh, First Chronicles 7.27 where it says, Nun was his son and Joshua his son. We're talking about the descendants of Ephraim. There's an ending. There's just an ending. There's no more continuation after Joshua. He didn't have any sons. Which implies he had no children, no sons. And this tradition differs from the following statement. That Joshua was punished, um, Joshua was punished to remain childless because he prevented the Jewish people from fulfilling the commandment of being fruitful and multiply. Somehow or another, he prevented the Jews from being fruitful and multiply, so he was punished. That goes against this idea that he himself um, caused it. I mean, he did cause it, but in a secondary. But the main point that I'm bringing this Gemara in is because there's an argument. That was one opinion, that he, um, he didn't have children, or he prevented the Jewish people from having children. And how do you know? 
So it says in Joshua 5.13, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood over him against him with a sword drawn in his hand. Now it also says, the next verse, 5.14, he said, No, but I am a captain of the host of the Lord. I am now come. What does it mean, I am now come? Oto bati. So the man, an angel, came to demand something of Joshua to rebuke him. The angel said, last night, due to your preparations for war, so they were pre preparing for war the day before, you ne neglected the evening offering, uh, offering. There was a daily offering, one in the morning, one in the evening. And now tonight, you're neglecting Torah study. You, you neglect Torah study to prepare for war? Never neglect Torah study. Joshua was asked of him, for which of these sins have you specifically come? Meaning he is aware of the fact, he just had the conversation, that you prevented the people from having uh, um, uh, involved in, in um, I'm sorry, uh, the two sins are, one is the, um, the, the morning offering, the, the daily offering, and the other is uh, neglecting Torah study. So the fact he says, I now come, so the Gemara says, the fact that I didn't come last night and waited until now show you, shows you the sin of neglecting Torah study is more severe. It's more severe than not putting up the daily offering. Joshua immediately acted to rectify the matter by deciding that he must devote more time to learning, as it says in Joshua 8.13. And Joshua walked that night in the midst of the valley and what's the name for valley? Emek. When you learn Torah, amuk, deep, okay, you learn Torah, depth. And this is what he says, Rav Yochanan said, this teaches that he walked all night in the depth of halacha, thereby atoning for his previously, previous neglect, the neglect of Torah study. Okay, so that pretty much hits the point home that number one, you fight your Yitzhar. Number two, you have to learn Torah. And we see here that the Gezer uh, Shava, the Kohen is going to speak to the people, and we see that uh, in just in general, Torah study is a very severe, uh, neglecting Torah study is a very severe uh, crime. The Talmud shall davar, and this is the reason why, Shatamu Torah's magen biyad ha Yitzharah, that the, the studying of Torah guards you against your Yitzharah, and the Sutton is mekatreg biyot b'shasakana, and we all know that the Sutton is persecuting more at the time of danger. Now, this is a very interesting question. Are all the Jews B'nai Torah? Are they all such Tamudei Chachamim? Can they all learn Torah? Listen to what he says. Perhaps someone's not in that category. We know not everyone can sit and learn. If that's the case, the big question is, those groups that don't learn, how are they ever going to be saved from their inner, 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 inner enemy in a war? That's why it says, Shema Yisrael. The Kohen, he's going to get up there, he's going to say Shema Yisrael, meaning the Shema itself. Every Jew knows how to read the Shema. You don't have to be a big Tamil Chacham. You don't have to know the whole Torah. You don't have to know how many Mishnayas. Everyone knows the, the, the Shema Yisrael. And through that, you, the, everyone would be saved from the interference or the payback of the enemy. What if you have someone who's really ignorant and he doesn't even know Krishma or Eza Ish Kashe Oref or someone who is just so stubborn? Uh, whereas Yetzirah is Chazak Nimenu, he just has very strong inclination not to do the right thing. You got no response, there's nothing you could. It's like you're, not, you're like you're talking to a wall. He's got nothing, not Torah and not Kriyashma. You remind him of the day of his death. And that's why the Kohen says, as we know, who is a man who built a house? Who's the one who just got married? 
And but the words are, lest you die in war. I mean, just look at the Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 4 through 8. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight with you against your enemies to save you. The officer shall speak to the people, saying, Where is the man? What is a man who has built a new house and has not yet inaugurated? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the war. And then another man inaugurated. And what, is, what about the man who planted a vineyard and has not yet redeemed, redeemed it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the war. And another man redeem it. And what about the man who betrothed the woman and has not yet taken her? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the war. Three times. If this is not a reminder of the day of your death, what is? So it's like pretty much black and white here. So Bahaskar Samisha you see that by way of this narrative, the day of your death is being mentioned, Yitzravadai, for that last category of people who are totally ignoramus and don't know the don't know the Krishna, at least remind them the day of their death. We only have a few more minutes, but I want to finish off with this this paragraph. He quotes uh, Genesis chapter four. Verse 7. This is what God says to Cain. Uh, after his offering was not accepted, Abel's was. He says, Im tetiv says, If you improve, and Rashi says, If you work on your character, you will be forgiven, meaning you'll be saved. Vim lo tetiv, and if you don't work on your character, you don't improve. Le pesach hatas roivets. That means that sin is waiting for an ambush at the door. Meaning to say, Yizkor lo Pesach Kivro, you should remember the opening of your grave. The Azafa pi Alecha Teshukato, because the verse continues, if you don't, or even though that it, the Yitzhahara, desires its longing is towards you, nevertheless, the answer is, Atatim Shalbo, you have every ability to control your Yitzhahara. Okay, now this is the. Uh, the landing strip, okay? Hang in there, guys. Did you know this? For the living, no, they will die. In, in, um, in Kehelis, Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 5. Do you know the living know they're going to die? No kidding. But who's it talking about? The righteous. The righteous people are cognizant of the fact that this life is short. Right? For these people who think they're going to live forever and they're going to stay in their homes until there's no more virus, until there's a, uh, what's the word, a vaccine. You ain't living, man. Get out there and live. Sorry to tell you. Unless you're very old and you have uh, preconditioned, pre, uh, you know, pre-existing conditions. But anyway. So, the, for the living know they're going to die, they're tzaddikim. Meaning to say, they know they're going to die. They know they're going to die. They always think, as it says in Perkyavos, do tshuva one day before you're going to die. And since we don't know where we're going to die, we're always going to be in a state of sobriety. This will save you from sin. That same verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 5, it ends by saying, but the dead know nothing. What do you mean the dead know nothing? These are the, de these are the evil people. That While they're alive, they're actually called dead. And how do we know that? In Ezekiel chapter 21, verse 30, it says over there, and you wicked man sentenced to be slain, meaning you're already slain. And that was, um, that was King Tzedekiahu. So, Russia, yomo be'es avon kates. The rest of the verse um, says like this, uh, whose day has come at the end of his iniquity. What does it mean? Whose end has come whose day has come at the end of his iniquity. Meaning to say, Bavor havon, because of sin, shel haket shalo. That means, that because of your sin, your end will come. Kiloya zikron ket shalo leneged enav klal. Kiloya zikron, because you didn't have that zikron of your end. Against your eyes always. You thought you were going to live forever. But not like David. David in chapter, in, in Tehillim, chapter 39, verse 5. He asks God, he prays to God, he says, Let me know my end. Hodiyeni Hashem Kitsi. I want to know when I'm going to die. 
So that's the righteous. That's King David. But not these evil people. Rather, the verse continues, and, and this is um, in actually it's chapter 49, verse 12 of Psalms. It says, Kirbam batemo leolam, which means like this, that in their hearts, kirbam, kirbam means like in their innards, batemo, their houses are going to be forever. The Kliakar, I told you in the beginning, he took over the job of the Rav of, of Prague, and there were many wealthy people, many wealthy Jews there. And they had castles. They had mansions. And they used the most expensive, uh, what do you call these? Tiles, what do you call it? Marble. And he gave, it's not, how can you, your rabbi, your own congregation is telling his own congregation, you should be using that money to help the poor. You should be moving to Israel. What are you building houses here in Hutzlarts? What are you building this forever? He was able to give those kind of tochacha. King David also did. <laughs> this is the evil people. They think that this life is forever. Zep, right? Zep Hiroshikar, he ends. This is a very dear explanation. And with that, I just want to say, this should touch us. We should really, you know, review these lessons, make, internalize it. We should understand how important it is to, obviously to beat our Yetzirah, that's the whole goal, but the procedure, do everything you can, right? Have awe and fear of Hashem, learn Torah, do the Kriya Shema, of course when you're supposed to, and beyond, you could say Shema all day long, and to remember the day of your death, okay? So Bizrat Hashem, these lessons, we can, we, with these lessons, we will not only beat and be victorious over our inner Yetzirah, but through becoming righteous, we will conquer the world, right? We will uh, prosper as a nation and to carry this on, this heritage to our children. Bezrat Hashem. I wish everyone a Shabbat Shalom. Kol Tuv, a happy life. Rabbi Breidewitz will Bezrat Hashem be here next week with part two of Kriyashma. So it's very good that we already touched on a few ideas here. Any questions?